introduction to ASP.NET and Visual Studio tooling. So first I want to show you um, the kind of recent releases. So the web development world moves very quickly. Um, there are new versions of, you know, there are new JavaScript libraries coming out, out all the time. Since we've been talking this morning, there have been three releases of Google Chrome. Um, there are new standards coming out. It's, it's a very rapidly moving uh, field. And so in order for you to be able to keep up, we want to give you updated tools and frameworks. You don't have to always be on the newest one, but it's nice to know that we're not going to be holding you up. So we try and give you a significant release about every six months. So you'll see Visual Studio 2012, September 2012, and then Visual Studio 2013 in October of 2013. Those had a lot of new features uh, here, you know, uh, MVC4, MVC5, a lot of uh, features in both of these. Also, we do these point releases. So what we've done in uh, February, so just September to February, we added a lot in 2012.2, and then again from October to March, we added a lot of features in 2013.2. So these are uh, updates to Visual Studio. If you're running, um, if you're using, you know, Visual Studio, I recommend that you get the regular updates. Uh, they really work hard, especially on those um, those point releases, not to have breaking changes, and you know, you get. Not only newer, um, oh, you get newer project templates and things. You also get better tooling. So, you know, just better Visual Studio works better for you. Uh, so this is just quickly. This is what was in Visual Studio 2012.2. So this was a rather significant release. We had a, a lot of features added uh, for web forms. Um, if you're doing web forms development. Um, I don't really have time to talk about it during the session, but please talk to me during the break because there are some really, um, some really good things that have been added. Um, there's model binding, strongly typed data controls, friendly URLs, a lot of features that really can help you modernize web forms applications. And uh, I don't, usually when I talk to web developers who are doing web forms, they don't know about those features. And they're, they're, you need to know about them. Uh, so we also introduced SignalR as part of the ASP.NET platform uh, and in Visual Studio with Visual Studio support. Uh, Web API release, uh, MVC updates, and then Visual Studio tooling, a lot of things. Um, a big thing there was Page Inspector, which allows you to work with a, the design of your page inside of Visual Studio and actually see it rendered running against your database and executing code. So the reason I show that is that, and we'll look at 2013.2 as well, these point releases are bring you a lot of features. One of the big features we introduced with 2013, Visual Studio 2013, is the idea of one ASP.NET. So the idea is that we want to bring all of these things together and make them work smoothly together. So if you have a web forms application and you want to use um, MVC in it as well, it's not hard to do that. Another thing we did as part of that is we changed how a lot of the core works inside of ASP.NET so that all of these things work smoothly together. And in doing that, we also made it so that you can plug in as well. So anywhere, in, anywhere that you would like to take advantage of ASP.NET, you can fit right in as a first class citizen. And we're doing that using things like OWEN, which is the open web interfaces for .NET. And that's an open, open standard. Um, because of that, uh, frameworks like uh, Nancy and Service Stack, we really are working to make them plug in just as well. Is anyone using Nancy FX? So the, the point is it's a broader ecosystem, and we're making it so that other people writing open source stacks can integrate very well with ASP.NET. So in the past when you created an ASP.NET application, we made you make some difficult choices. So I, I like to think of 
the distinction between options and choices. So I think of a choice as something like uh, I, ha I have to pick something and I'm stuck with that choice. But if I have options, I can pick a little of this or that. So as an example, uh, if somebody said, um, what would you like to eat for the rest of your life? Right? <laughs> and I have to pick, well, pizza or spaghetti or steak. I don't wanna, I wanna every day pick a little of different ones, right? So I want the options each, you know, as I need them. So what we've done here is when you create a new project, we have some templates here, empty web forms, MVC, to get you started. If you're creating a mostly MVC application, we'll set things up for you. But here, this is key. There are checkboxes here that say add folders and core references for web forms, MVC, or web API. So what that means is I can say I would like a web forms application with MVC support. Or I would like an empty project with web forms and web API. So I can pick and choose what I want. Does that make sense? I'll show a demonstration of that in a second. Another nice thing as part of that still being options is you can add these in later. So if you go through and you say, oh, just, just MVC for me today, click OK, start working. Two months later, you say, wow, I actually did want web forms. Or I actually did want MVC. You can bring that in right away. It automatically will pull those, that support in. And the support, as I mentioned, for all of these is via NuGet packages. So it's very easy to add those in. OK. I think. I may have a demo. Good, I do. So, let's create a new application. Oh, let me make sure I'm on high performance. We were in Italy last week, and or yeah, last week, and I was on power saver mode, and I was like, why is everything so slow? Okay, so here I have the option, right? So I can pick, this is that dialogue I was just showing you. So first we have these templates, and I can say, you know, I would like a mostly web forms, but I also want to check off these other ones, right? So that's kind of the idea. So here I'm going to create a mostly web forms project, adding in MVC and web API support. And that's all I have to do. As part of that, we've refactored the authentication as well. So here we use the same authentication system for everything, and it's a brand new authentication system. So we have four different options that are, that are built right when you create a file new project. There's no authentication, which is for a public website. Uh, Individual user accounts would be for logging in using something that's stored in your database. So you can think of username, password, or uh, like OAuth, um, you know, Twitter, Google, Facebook, Microsoft account. Then organiza organizational account for Active Directory. So this includes support for Office 365 and Azure Active Directory. And so this makes it pretty easy to set that up. And then finally, there's also Windows authentication. If you're running on a local intranet and everyone's hooked up with Windows authentication, that's handled. So I'm just going to cancel that. One other thing I want to point out is that we also have support for, as you're creating the project, you can click that and it'll create, and, you know, create those resources for you right from the beginning. So you could say, I'm building a site, and I already know what the URL is, and I already know the development URL, and I already know the database, and it'll create those right from the beginning. So that can be especially handy if you're working with a team and you would like to have a database server already set up right from the beginning of the project. Okay. So while that's going, I'll try and pour some water and not on my laptop. So one thing... Oh, oh, it went too fast. Uh, one thing that it's doing there is if you watch this, when you create a new project, it is pulling in all these NuGet packages. Okay? So I'll show you quickly where those are. 
there's a file called packages.config. And this is it. This is what's in file new project. Okay. So there, there are a good amount of them. Um, but that's good because this, th they're kind of smaller and it la it's more broken apart. So you can pull in exactly what you'd like. So you'll notice we have things like uh, web API support is in a NuGet package. Um, MVC support, Razor support, all of these things are packaged. Um, okay, so in this application, what I'm going to do really quickly, I'll show you that first we've got, you know, we have web forms, files, but we also, because I picked uh, add in support for MVC, I've got models, views, and controllers. Now, um, I'm trying to think of how much time I have. Uh, yeah, so I'm quickly going to scaffold something out, and, and I'll, I'll show you an example using web forms and MVC together here. So I'm going to create a new model. First, uh, is that a good size? Can you see okay if I do something like that? Okay, so that's 133. So I'm going to create a new model, and in this case, we'll just create a person model. And we'll give this person an ID. Okay. Uh, so this, by default, we're going to be using entity framework code first. And this is completely up to you. You don't have to use that if you don't want to. But it is a very simple way to define your models and code and have the database automatically generated for you and all the persistence handled for you. So now I'm going to go in and I'm going to scaffold that. So first I'll scaffold using MVC. So this is kind of the standard scaffolding system that we've had in the past. But you'll notice it looks a little bit different and that's because we've actually rewritten everything underneath it. So now we have a new scaffolding system that is completely Oops, I didn't build yet. We have a new scaffolding system that works all the way across ASP.NET. So it works for MVC, but it also is going to work for Web API, Web Forms, an empty project, and you can write your own scaffolding as well. So, that in a second. So what scaffolding does is generate boilerplate code. So I've already written a model. So if I want pages to browse that model, I'm going to need a person, a controller for handling persons. Notice here that it pluralizes it. So this is a people controller to handle a type of person. And then it also creates views here. So here are my people views. So if you're familiar with MVC, this is, this is kind of a standard way to generate some pages to get started. And then you can use those just as you're working and delete them, or you may you know, develop them further. So that's MVC, but now I'd also like to scaffold out web forms. And so we've just added that support. So here I'm going to go in and I'm going to say uh, new scaffolded item, and I'm going to say web forms. I'd like to scaffold in web pages using Entity Framework. So here again, I'm going to use that same model and entity context. So what this is doing is scaffolding um, a lot of editing pages for me using web forms this time. Now, the idea would be I may have a mostly MVC application, but I want to use web forms for some of my administration section of the site. Or I have some uh, web forms uh, controls that my team uses, maybe a grid controller or you know, a Silverlight based controller, something like that that I would prefer to use in web forms. So here, it scaffolded all that out. Now, one thing I want to do is I'm going to change a namespace because uh, sometimes when I do this, there's a conflict. Yeah. So if I go into Web Application 35, Good. 
So, and just just to um, you know keep going with this uh, a quick step further, I'm also going to scaffold in Web API as well. And so Web, Web API actually scaffolds very quickly because it's uh, there's no view, there's nothing else to scaffolding. So I'll add that. So I'll pick a person. Go. So the two things, the reason I'm showing you this is number one, um, to show that in in an application I can use all three things together very smoothly. Two, I wanted to show you that scaffolding system and show you that it works no matter where you are in ASP.NET. So that's a core thing you'll see in, in Visual Studio 2013. And um, also that we're using the same kind of programming model there. So if you're using web forms, I recommend you look at, at the new scaffolding system and at model, uh, model binding and strongly typed data controls because they'll let you more fluidly move between web forms and MVC. If you have web forms applications and you'd like to update them to MVC, that this is a smooth way to do that. So I think if I go to people, this is going to create a, a form, and I, I forget actually which one comes up first. They they look they look almost the same, um, which is a good thing. So that is, as it spins up, it's actually creating the database for me. And now I can go in and I can say, you know, John. Okay. So, uh, so there's that one. And I believe that that was the MVC one. And then if I go to person, So this is the web forms view. It's using the same model and accessing everything, and it, and it's it's going to look, you know, it's 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 the same kind of thing. So. One nice thing to notice here is that URL now in web forms is um, the URL is is using is using friendly URLs. So this is application slash person slash default. So that's something we added in 2012.2. Any questions on that? Yeah. yeah. Uh, if you had also ID for the control, you have all control. Yeah, so here it selected uh, slash ID equals one, but I believe I could just say one. I'm not sure why that is, honestly. It. I would think it should work. Um. Uh, if I well, if I get yeah, it's true. That would show the details. Uh, I don't know. Honestly, I haven't messed with that. So it depends how they've set up the um, the scaffolding for that. But it should work. Uh, the point is that. Um, if if I you know look at the code that the um, friendly URLs allows for doing that. So. All right. So that's one ASP.NET, and that is really one of the big features in in Visual Studio 2013 for for ASP.NET development. As part of doing that, there are a lot of new core features. So. One is Bootstrap templates. Bootstrap is a uh, web theme system. Uh, so it's, a, it's kind of a front-end system for, for web development. And it's not just about AS, or it's not just about ASP.NET. People use this everywhere. PHP, Rails, everywhere. It's very common. So it includes uh, all kinds of things, like even uh, you know, glyph icons. It includes buttons. It includes, you know, things like image thumbnails, um, pagination. So there's a lot built in. The reason we did this is so that you can um, get started with a good theme, and it will also um, it allows you to take advantage of other themes and things that other people have written. So actually, I'll show you in that ac application we just wrote. I'll spin it back up. So um, 
you'll notice here that this is what the look what it looks like and because I had it all zoomed in I was showing so here the wider screen view right so this is the desktop view and actually that already looks you know big because I've stretched it out but this application when viewed on a mobile phone will automatically have you know, nice menus, everything lines up well for that. And that's because this is built so that it, you know, works well on um, larger and smaller device sizes. So that's one of the things that's just built into that. Another thing we can do with this is there are a lot of themes out there. So if I go to uh, Bootswatch, Bootswatch is an example site that has free ones, and there are a lot of other ones that are available um, you know, nice paid ones as well. So here, let's figure out where my CSS file is, and I'm just going to overwrite it real quick. So here, I think I want to say copy path. Now I'm going to download some new CSS. Um, I'll grab this one here. So save target as, and I'm just going to overwrite my CSS there. Okay. And so now let's go in, and there it is. Now, you may notice, uh, I don't know if you could tell, I didn't even hit F5 to refresh this, and that's because of something I'll be showing you in a little bit. But So this is, an, this, I mean, this is a different look. It's a new theme for my site. You know, it looks pretty decent, and this is a free one. There are some really nice paid ones out there as well. So I think this was a, a good move by the, the ASP.NET team to move to using this common um, system. Uh, we also added in uh, the identity system. So I showed you um, at the beginning how we can pick no authentication or, you know, those different types. And this identity system is built so that it's completely configurable. So uh, we wire that up actually using a, a middleware kind of thing. And you don't need to understand this if you don't want to. <laughs> but um, the idea is that this authentication is now kind of hooked in as part of the stack. So... If you, try, if you tried to modify ASP.NET authentication in the past, it was a little difficult. And we've made that so that it's now just completely part of, um, it's a pluggable part of the stack. So you can go in and, you know, for instance, if you want to, here's how you configure Google authentication, right? So, you know, very simple to just plug any of those things in. So... Um, it's also built so that it's easy to extend in other ways. So for instance, there are examples that we've just put out for things like two-factor authentication. And um, what that means, of course, is you log into the site, and then the site sends you an SMS or, or you know, use an authenticator application on your phone to give you a, a one-time key and type that in on there as well. Is anyone using that kind of thing for authentication? It adds some more security. And so that's... Uh, that's an example of something that's built into the identity system. Uh, scaffolding we've looked at a few times. Um, the scaffolding system is also built so that you can write your own custom scaffolders. And as an example of that, the, um, the web form scaffolding I showed you is actually an open source scaffolder that someone outside of Microsoft has written. Um, and so uh, you know, we can look through and here's all the code for it. The user interface is written in XAML, um, so you can go in and design your own. Um, and if we look at the scaffolders, um, the scaffold, you know, this is doing quite a bit, so there is a good amount of code. Um, but really the, the, the code does a few things. It says, um, first present a user interface to allow me to pick which model and select other options. And then there's something in here that just says basically generate code. <laughs> and that's where I can go in and I can uh, create, here it is, generate code. So, and there's an API for scaffolding that will set all this up. So I'm, I'm going pretty fast. I'm, I hope I'm not losing people. I'm trying to catch up with, uh, with 
the time because there's a lot of other good things to show um, show you today. So if you do have more questions on these, please ask uh, during the break. Um, and then Owen, I already showed you an example of the authentication system is built using Owen. And the idea what we did with Owen is in the past, if you wanted to extend ASP.NET, you needed to plug in a provider and web config, and you had to learn each different type of API to do that. And it only worked on IIS and ASP.NET and SQL Server and that kind of thing. And what we've done with Owen is it's, it is an open standard, and we are supporting it. Microsoft does not run or own Owen. It's, it's a community standard. And it's a, it's a pluggable middleware, so you can plug things in at different parts. For instance, David Fowler that just popped up on chat earlier, um, a few months ago we wrote one for fun uh, that reversed every string <laughs> that came through. So when you looked at the ASP site instead of ASP.net, it was, you know, 10 dot as whatever. <laughs> and of course, we had to be careful not to reverse the, the HTML tags. Um, but that's an example and, of course, a silly one. Um, but you can use it for all kinds of things, caching, optimization, authentication, all these things, right? Uh, I think we've already looked at those. So I've shown you kind of some highlights. These are, and I, I realize you don't need to read all these, um, but these are the things we added in 2013. Dot, or in 2013. And then these are the things, uh, well, there's another slide in here somewhere. We added a bunch of other things in 2013.2 that's the same amount of stuff, right? So there's a lot, a lot of new features that have been added. Uh, web tools. So I have 15 minutes, so I'm going to just quickly show you some cool web tools. Um, and then we'll take, I think we take a break, 10, maybe... Do you want to take a short coffee break or something after that? Yeah, maybe coffee arrives. Coffee arrives okay, sounds good. All right, web tools. So remember earlier I said that I, I want you to think of Visual Studio as a great editor for all of your web, to, web files. And that's, that includes HTML, CSS, JavaScript, etc. So in Visual Studio 2013, we complete, completely rewrote the HTML editor. Um, in the past, we'd already done that with our JavaScript editor and our CSS editor, and we wanted to be able to support you know, modern standards. We wanted to be able to parse the HTML and say, oh, you added a label. Well, we can complete that. We can say label four, and we know what inputs you have on your page. <laughs> Maybe the coffee will be late. <laughs> um, so so that's, that's an example. Um, that made me think of this water here. Um, so, so uh, you know, we, we can support things like we understand if you're using Bootstrap in your application and provide you IntelliSense for Bootstrap classes. Or if you're using AngularJS, we can auto-complete things. And we can find errors for you. Uh, so that's, that's all part of this new HTML editor. Browser link. Has anyone, do people, are people familiar with browser link? Okay, browser link is a real-time socket connection. When you're, when you're developing, Visual Studio sets up a real-time socket connection between any connected browser. So what that means is if I have three browsers running on my desktop, Chrome, Firefox, uh, IE, Opera, that's four, and then a, a, a mobile emulator, maybe an iPhone emulator, it will automatically connect to those. As I change my code, it will refresh those browsers, and it will allow me to use the browser tools to push things back to Visual Studio. And what's also nice is that this is built so that you can write your own uh, extensions for Browser Link as well. And uh, so we'll, we'll see some of those. AngularJS IntelliSense as well. Um, so I think... Before I do the demo, I'll just point these out. That was 2013, and then we just released 2013.2. We included more or less support, which is kind of funny. 
more or less, uh, a JSON editor, which is really handy, and it includes things like JSON schema, um, uh, a phone emulator. What we did with the phone emulator is if you tried to use the Windows phone emulator to view an ASP.NET application in the past, it was a little difficult because the phone emulator was a virtual machine and there were networking issues, so we solved that. It's it just it all works now. Another neat thing we did is easy SSL support. So if you're developing locally, we can you check a box and we'll create a self-signed certificate for you so you can develop against the SSL locally without any extra work. Um, web essentials. So the the web or the project manager at Microsoft that owns the web tools, his name's Mads Christensen. All day he works on those at Microsoft, and then he goes home and he works on Web Essentials. And Web Essentials is an extension, and it's kind of where he tests out different ideas for web tools and Visual Studio. It's open source, so um, anyone else can contribute to it, can look at the code, and people do. There's, uh, I, last night I was looking at it, and you know I saw check-ins eight minutes ago, 25 minutes ago. Like it's very, you know, regular updates. And so the idea is we try out features here, and if we like them, then they get moved into Visual Studio. Um, and this releases, they have releases for this every month or two, and you can actually run the nightly releases of it. That's what I'm doing. Um, so if you go to vswebessentials.com, um, you can install that and try it out. The exciting new announcement here is that we just added support for Web Express. So, yeah, so Visual Studio is, um, there's, you know, Visual Studio Ultimate all the way down to Express. Um, the, the full versions are more expensive and have more features. One of those features has been that we supported uh, extensions, and, Visual, and Web Essentials is an extension. Um, so we just now made, made a special exception to allow Web Essentials to run on the free version of, web, of Visual Studio. One other uh, interesting, very useful um, extension for web, web developers in Visual Studio is called Sidewaffle. Yes, it's a silly name. Um, the idea is that you can, uh, if you're adding in, uh, it makes it easier for you to add in additional web developer templates. So things like here, if I type in Angular, I can get Angular controllers and directives and factories and things like that. It has a huge amount of different templates available. So let's take a look real quick at that. If I go, uh, so side waffle. Okay. So here's what we're looking at here. Right? So that's quite a bit. That also is open source. So some, some of the things, you know, let's just, uh, Drandall, Fave Icon, uh, Grunt, HTML, Smart Tags. Uh, here's one that you may not have expected. We actually have really good support for building Chrome extensions and themes. So it's kind of funny, but actually the best experience right now for building a Chrome extension is in Visual Studio using Sidewaffle. Bar none, it's the best. It sets you up, it automatically installs, creates everything. Um, so this is a great, if you're doing web development and you're thinking of Visual Studio as just a C-sharp editor, you're missing out. And if you're thinking of it as just an ASP.NET HTML CSS editor, you're missing out too, because uh, with Sidewaffle, it really helps you do just about anything, including, you know, robots.txt, um, JS Lint, Nancy, any, you know, et cetera. Whoa. Okay, so let's, uh, I think, I want to do some demos, and then that's it. So, take a look at that. I'm going to close down Web Application 35 and move to Web Application 31. So here I have, you know, basically the same kind of thing. This is, a, um, this is an MVC application. And I'm going to browse this with two browsers. So I'm going to say, 
browse with. That is not what I wanted to do. So on here, I'm going to click this Browse With button. Then I'm going to select Firefox and IE. Right? And then I'm also going to say I would like to set the default size to uh, 800, 600. Okay. So what that's doing is that spun up the site for me in two different browsers. There. And then shut them down. I tell you, okay, let me try this again. Trying to do that zoom did not work. There we go. So the point is, um, you know, here's the site running in two different browsers. So now I'm going to try and arrange these so that we can see Visual Studio and both browsers at the same time, which is not easy to do. <laughs> All right, let's try this. Now, actually, that's, that's worth doing because um, what we're seeing there is I didn't just have to launch it through Visual Studio, right? I'm still going to get the same experience. So now I'm going to go like this. There. Okay, great. So now let's say that I want to go in and I want to start editing my source code here. So I'm going to go and say ASP.NET is awesome. Okay. And then I'm going to click this little circle thing. Actually, let's zoom in here. That says browser link, two browsers connected, right? So that, that realizes there's two people connected to this site, and it automatically updates that one and this one, right? So when I click that circle thing. So that's, that's very helpful. As I'm editing, I get this kind of live reload kind of thing, and, um, and I can get quite a bit done that way. Now, I'm, I just clicked my... Uh, the control button there, and I toggled this little thing down here. This is being shown because I have Web Essentials installed. So here, I'm going to click that again, and I'm going to turn on a thing called Auto Sync. Okay? So now, if I go down here into IE and I click Control, that auto already had it enabled, right? Because the two are all they're all connected. So now let's go in. And I'm going to I'll make this one full size here. Actually, let's use Firefox just to mix it up. Okay. So here I'm going to go in and stretch this one out, and we'll bring up those browser tools. So I'm going to right-click and inspect element, and I'm going to inspect this header. Okay, so I'll go to this, and I'll say, scroll down a bit, and I'll... Actually, first, before I do that, I would like to change some text in here. So let me do that. Um, you know how sometimes you've got some source code that generates HTML, and you've got a lot of different files and includes and things, and you don't know what generated what? So let's say I'm going in, and I, I want to figure out where this is coming from. You see, As I move over the page, it's opening the files in Visual Studio. So when I'm in the page itself here, it's opening them up in index. But when I click, when I move to the header, it's layout.cshtml, right? So this is automatically opening those and going to the exact line of code. Now, what would be better, though, is if I actually, if I wanted to make a change, what if I do this, and I'll just say, right? Okay, so it's automatically, now that's because I, if, if you're getting scared, oh no, I work in the editor and it's moving back, right? This is because I clicked that button. But this solves that problem of I'm working away in, in my browser tools to get everything lined up and looking how I want, and now I have to go back into my code and type everything all over again, right? That's frustrating. And so this automatically is going to sync those. So that's, that's pretty neat. Uh, let's put this back here. So now I want to go in and I want to use my browser editor tools. Now, um, I'm a lot of the time, you know, it's it's more more um, 
we've got great CSS, HTML, JavaScript editors in Visual Studio, but we realize sometimes it's easier to work directly in the page, right? And you see what you're changing. And maybe you're more familiar with those tools. So here, I would like to change this nav bar, right? Let's say I want to make this more of a blue, or let's go with a green. You see what it's done? It's opened up my CSS, gone to the exact line of code, and it's updated it there. See? And if I went in and started changing the alpha, it's going to switch from RGB to RGBA. So now, let's flip over to IE and make that change. Right? And we don't have to because they're all connected and it's already pushed that change over. Right? So that's really slick. One other thing I want to do while we're at it is I want to change the footer. So now let's make, let's bring up the browser tools here in IE. And I'm going to find my footer. All right, so I'll go right click, uh, inspect element, there we go. Okay, so there I found my footer, and I would like to change the color to purple. Now let's find out if it made that change here, and it did. So here it went in and it made that change in my, in my CSS, but notice this isn't just CSS, this is a less file. So uh, CSS is, is awesome, but it sometimes is not as flexible as we'd like. It doesn't in include support for things like uh, variables and functions and nesting, right, inheritance. So less is an example of a meta language that compiles down to CSS. So here you can see uh, browser link found the generated CSS, used the source maps, and then went back up and it found the less file that's associated and fixed that exact line of code, right? So that is also pretty useful. I want to show you one more thing in here. That is, I've got a bunch of images, right? So these, this is pretty common. You have a bunch of small images in an application, right? So these are sharing icons, right? And instead of making a bunch of, let's say I repeat these over and over throughout the page. Instead of making a bunch of small requests, what I'd like to do instead is group those into a single image, an image sprite, right? So I'm going to right click on this and say, create image sprite. And, you know, give it a name. I've done this before and it's overriding. So here is the image, right? You notice as I'm hovering, by the way, that it's showing those. That's part of Web Essentials, and that's also kind of handy, right? So now if I double click on this, this is going to bring up that image. Notice that kind of, you know, that green checkered background. That means it's a transparent image, right? Now, the way that image sprites work is we have one image, we load it once, and then we use CSS to just move it around, and we copy it around, right? And, and just show little bits of it. So uh, you can do that. It, creating the image sprite itself is actually not that big a deal. The, the bigger part is actually using it, uh, creating that CSS. So here's some example CSS that we've automatically generated for you to do that, to, to include this. So I could say dot content images, FB48, whatever, and, it'll, and that'll show that. But there's still a problem with this, and, and that is, as I change things over time, I'm going to have to keep everything updated. And fortunately, we automatically, when you add new images in, we'll regenerate all these classes for you. So that's pretty handy. One other thing is, if I wanted to use this in my less file, let's take a look at how we do that. So here I'm going to take some less mix-ins. So we actually generate less mix-ins for you. Uh, and I'm going to drag and drop that right over into here. It automatically adds an import for me. right? So it, it understands the syntax. It knows how to add an import. And now, 
I want to go into my footer, let's change my footer instead of all this. Use one of those mix ins. So I'll say dot, right? So now I want to say I would like it to be a large Facebook icon instead, right? So now when I save this, we automatically compile that from less into CSS on the other side. And when I go back over here, again, I didn't have to refresh. It automatically updates it, right? And there's my Facebook icon. Better. So the idea is that you know, we, we've really put a lot of work into making it so that you can do you know, modern web development in Visual Studio, really kind of pushing the limits of what's, what's possible, uh, and leveraging the connection of we've got you know, Visual Studio hosting the socket connection, connecting to all these, um, connecting to your front end. What else? I want to close that down. Okay. Well, we're about cut up on time. Did the coffee arrive? Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, why don't we take a short break and uh, start thinking of questions for me, all right?